Good afternoon. I thought that an interesting place to start this story would be from the beginning. Last May, an architect friend of mine, Catherine Faust, asked me if I was interested in meeting a friend of hers, Melissa Leppard. Melissa is a, a local educator and the woman responsible for bringing Giver Tully, the author, to Buffalo. Now, Giver Tully is famed for writing the book, 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Children Do. Melissa is also the founder of Buffalo's Tinkering School, which is built after Giver Tully's own tinkering school in Austin. Now, Tinkering School is a camp, if you will, a place where kids are encouraged to take things apart, to work with their hands, and really explore how things work. To tinker, obviously, a word that's often uh, lost on today's generation. Now, uh, Catherine and Melissa knew of my work, and uh, particularly in the world of play, and some frustration that I have regarding what the United States tends to deem as appropriate play and inappropriate play. An appropriate play seems to be anything that comes in a brightly colored box from Toys R Us that often needs assembly and usually needs batteries. They have decided that inappropriate play or something that so closely resembles the natural world that kids wouldn't actually need to experience the real world. They've decided that climbing trees is inappropriate, that playing in creeks and building tree forts and exploring their own neighborhoods is inappropriate. And heaven forbid they use a light bulb to bake a cake. Shocking, I know, but gone are the days of the real Easy Bake Oven. Now, Catherine's an architect, and she was particularly taken with the notion of just where our next great thinker was going to come from. Where would our next great architect, our next great builder, our next great designer come from if this sterile state of play were to continue? Play drives creativity. It drives inventiveness. <clears throat> this country was formed based around the idea of Yankee ingenuity. We built things, we created things, we think about things. But we've somehow decided that now it's inappropriate for our kids to lift heavy objects, to take apart the toaster, and to, heaven forbid, work in a glass factory like this boy did in the 1920s. And we all discussed it, and I'm sure that this audience might agree, that today's manufactured play equipment typically offers a less imaginative, less creative, less dynamic play experience. Gone are the days of the very old Bob Leather playgrounds, the playgrounds that were built by communities with wood and lots and lots of creativity. They're gone over concerns about splinters. They're gone over concerns about wood preservatives and about blind spots where, heaven forbid, a kid play without the watchful eye of an adult. Catherine and Melissa knew of my work with natural play, and particularly in schoolyards, where we're incorporating things like boulders and logs and water streams and plenty of tall plants for kids to climb and play in. So they approached me over coffee with this idea. This idea being, what if a group of kids could build their own playground? You know, kind of like the adventure playgrounds that came out of Europe after World War II. Or kind of the way that we all played, where we stole material from the basement, we grabbed our dad's hammer, we stole stuff from the construction site at the end of the subdivision. You know, kind of the way kids played from the beginning of time to maybe about the 1980s. And for a split second, we all said, it's fantastic. What an incredible idea. And we had this vision in our head of a sandy lot with piles of lumber and half-built tree forts and the tap, tap, tapping of hammers in the background. It was a beautiful sight. And then I had to say it. It would never happen. <laughs> Honestly, in the world of playground design, things like safety standards and fall zones and insurability and durability make this idea of kids building their own playground nearly impossible. Not that coupled with the idea that today's parents seem to have an, an overwhelming sense of fear of just about everything. It's almost as if the day you find out you're having a child, they give you your copy of what to expect when you're expecting, but then they also give you a manual on how to be afraid of just about everything you and your child will ever come in contact with. Even on community playgrounds where churches and schools and parents are coming together to build a playground for the kids, the kids aren't allowed on the build site. So 
without a doubt, we said, well, is there a bigger idea? Could we do this? What if this were not a permanent playground? What if this was an experience that happened as an event? It popped up, if you will. The kids could build, they'd get dirty, they would play, and then we would pack it all up and run away really, really fast before the police come. <laughs> right? So we could do this. We could totally do this. Now, at the time, I could not speak for Melissa or Catherine's days of civil disobedience, but I, for one, was willing to be arrested to save the state of play. So, from the corner of uh, an east side neighborhood, we decided we were indeed going to change the state of play, at least for one day. And we got permission. Councilman Damone Smith called us and asked us if we would host Pop-Up Park in his neighborhoods. So, on June 9th, 2012, despite the rain, 22 kids and families came out to play. And indeed, they changed the world. Now, what do you think you might get when you put a pile of kids and some basement scraps, some nails and some hammers, and even saws all on one spot? Well, some amazing things. <laughs> together with Joy Kuebler and Melissa Leppard because we were concerned about kids not having unstructured playtime and we decided to do this pop-up park project and I think that um, it's really important for kids to be able to play freely because those are going to be the future American inventors and we're having a great time here. That's a really small one, so you're going to put the drill that on. No, stop. Okay, stop the sack. We've got hammer and nails. Good, bring it up. Beautiful. Wait. It's pretty pretty. That's my hammer to go, yeah, I want to go, yeah. Last one, then we're putting the tire up. Well, I... We get the last one. Yay. Hey. Ow! Oh, a bell! Oh, oh.
Now, when we told kids that we were going to, uh, when we told people we were going to be um, giving kids real materials and real tools, by far the question that we had was, how are you going to keep the kids from hurting themselves and hurting other people? And we kind of scratched our head, and I'm not quite sure if people thought we were going to have like all-out hammer throws or kids were going to be lining up to saw off each other's feet. You know, I'm not quite sure, but you know, admit it. You guys had the same thought, didn't you? Well, you know what? The kids were capable. We didn't have a single incident all day. They looked at giving a tool as a chance for responsibility, to be given a chance to be treated differently. And they rose to every single challenge. We had one finger scrape the entire day, and we had some bumps and some bruises. But all in all, not a bad day for play. So you know what else happens when you give a pile of kids and a pile of tools and a pile of materials? Well, you get a lot of ingenuity. They drew their ideas, they grabbed their materials, and they got to work. They were thinking the entire day. This little girl was a born engineer, and you could see her think all day. Now, despite the rain, construction got started pretty early, and we started off with things like teeter-totters. And, you know, that was fun, but you needed to make it a little bigger because, you know, that's what kids do. They make it bigger. And then the goal was bigger. And the kids had to figure out what to use in order to make that teeter-totter bigger, what to use to keep it from getting stuck in the mud, and what to do to get six big boys onto the teeter-totter. Now, yes, they slipped and they fell, and one kid was even launched off the end of this. But not a tear was shed. At this point, it was a pride thing. Swings. They wanted swings. They're a vital port of play. They wanted swings, and this little girl in purple was a powerhouse. She nagged until she got one. And we were quite surprised when the kids, as you saw in the video, didn't quite know how to hold on to the rope in order to swing on it. They got them, we got them swinging, they wanted the tire put on, and again, we were quite surprised that they didn't know how to sit on a tire swing. These are kids that had never experienced this type of play in their life. And once they got going, they got going, and they played on this swing for hours. Telephone, the old-fashioned game of telephone, came out of a flexible tubing. And literally, they would piece together sections of pipe, and every piece of pipe and flexible tubing that they could find, and they would test the connection. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And when they couldn't hear them anymore, they would back off that last section of pipe so that they could play the game. They also found out that the sound would get stuck where the, the hard PVC pipe met the flexible tube. So they borrowed a table that somebody else made, and they used it to elevate the telephone line. Surfing was a fantastic game, and this came out of teeter-totters, and it is challenging. A lot of adults tried it. They couldn't do it. The kids did it. They were amazing. At some point in the day, someone said, boy, I wish we had brought a ball. And then someone else said, well, we have balls. We have oranges. We have lots and lots of oranges. So this arcade game, if you will, came out of an orange, the flexible tubing, and a ladder. We had a sturdy wooden ladder. Now, this is a pop-up day, so we duct taped it to the tree, because that's what we had. Now, a lot of kids, as you would imagine, have never experienced really climbing a ladder. Now, they may have climbed a, a three rungs on a ladder on a manufactured piece of play equipment, but not a real ladder. So a lot of kids were apprehensive about doing this, but they took their time, they met the challenge, and when they did, we cheered. Now, at the end of this game, which went on for about 30 minutes, the ladder came down, and instantly we heard a kid scream, monkey bars! Right, so before we could even get it secured, <laughs> monkey bars were happening. They didn't even give us time to get it set up. But some of the creative play that was happening that day was just bits and pieces. It was piles. It was things they hammered. It was little scraps of wood that they cut and then nailed to a, a timber. Creative play happened everywhere. And you know what else? The day was fun. It was fantastic. Did you hear all that laughter, all that excitement in that video clip? The day was fun. And despite the rain, it poured the entire day. There was not a complaint. There was not a crossword. The day was great, filled with laughter and a lot of dirty shirts. So that day, we empowered kids. We empowered kids to create their own play experience. We did nothing more than give them scraps, 
and a space for this to be okay, for it to be okay for them to do anything. The best moment of the day for me was this little powerhouse girl in purple. She was only four or five years old, and she had climbed up the ladder for the arcade game, and she was really, really high. And I had called out to her to say, ah, uh, I think you're a little high. And she turned to me, she looked right at me, and she said, I'm a little scared, but I think I can do it. And that moment, the entire reason for the day came full circle. We had set out to do exactly this, to reach a child who could say, I'm a little scared, but I think I can do it. Parents and grandparents and neighbors came out to thank us that day, to say thank you for believing in our kids, for providing them an opportunity like they have never had before, an opportunity to think on their own, to play on their own, to be empowered. Now, this group of moms, armed with nothing more than a couple hundred dollars in donations, some scraps, some trash, set out to save the world or change the world, change the way we look at play in Buffalo for one day. Now, imagine if we could do that every day.